Okay. The year is 1999. No, wait. Let's hit the rewind button. The year is 1997. Nah. Okay. The year is 1995. No, wait. A little more. Okay. The year is 1991. Metal has officially reached the mainstream, thanks in large part to Metallica smashing the charts with their undoubtedly heavy, yet toned-down metal sound that would influence generations to come. The death metal scene was beginning to stagnate just as soon as it had gained solid footing, but many would aspire to uproot this sound by molding the death metal genre with their favorite avant-garde and jazz fusion sounds in coming years. Elsewhere, well, in Westchester, Pennsylvania to be exact, a 15-year-old Jersey-born kid would join his first notable band. Darren Miller entered This End Up initially as the rhythm guitarist. This End Up consisted originally of Andy Libby on lead vocals, John Teague on bass, Rich Vose on lead guitar, Dave Williams on drums, and Darren Miller, who also provided backup vocals as well as fulfilling rhythm guitar duties. This End Up was somewhere in the in-between of heavy metal and hard rock, two nebulous and unclear genre names if I've ever heard them. But this end up was, to me at least, a shockingly good high school band. Sometime in 1993, this end up would axe Andy Libby and promote Darren Miller to lead vocals. Though Darren never initially saw himself as a vocalist, he took it upon himself to learn as best as he could. This end up would play live in the local Westchester scene and record three cassette demos from 1992 to 1994. Darren Miller would eventually become frustrated with the band's creative direction as he aspired to harness the creative energy of his favorite genre, death metal. He would show his bandmates songs from bands like Death, Pestilence, Cynic, and the like, but they never quite heard what he had heard in the genre. Despite this, he was optimistic in that his band was relatively popular in the younger local scene. Eventually, this optimism would come to a screeching halt as his bandmates became more concerned with their futures in college than continuing the progress they've made in this end up. As Darren agonized over the impending breakup of his band, he'd make friends with someone who would essentially change the course of his life. While taking a freshman level math class in his senior year at East High School, Darren would befriend Jess Margera over their sense of humor. Initially, when Jess told Darren he was a drummer, it wasn't taken very seriously, and their first jam together was unproductive and unsuccessful. But on their second go-around, Darren was impressed with Jess's drumming, and the two would begin to work tirelessly on what would become, in many ways, a spiritual successor to Cynic's Focus and Pestilence's Spheres. This band's name? Foreign Objects. There were several times during the writing and rehearsal sessions for these songs that would almost see the end of this band before it even had begun. But Cooler Heads prevailed, and what would result was a criminally underrated gem of mid-90s death metal the undiscovered numbers and colors. Foreign Objects would enter Trix Track Studios in Malvum, Pennsylvania in summer 1995 with the initial plan to record a full-length album. This plan would soon be scrapped due in part to Darren's excitement to finish their strongest rehearsed material and Jess getting in a car accident and breaking his arm. Jess would accidentally reveal the details of Darren's new band to John Teague. Darren would happily play their work in progress for John and Dave Williams which would officially close the book on this end up. Foreign Objects would self-release the Undiscovered Numbers and Colors EP on Darren's newly established label, Distant Recordings. With a thousand copies pressed up, Jess was able to get the CD sold in local Westchester record stores. Whereas on the EP, Foreign Objects were a two-piece band, they were now ready to recruit a bassist and a rhythm guitar player. They eventually recruited a delinquent by the name of Drew and a flake businessman named Matt Rissmiller. They fired Matt promptly after he requested payment for every show and went on to play the Henderson High School Battle of the Bands. The judges didn't really understand, but the crowd was receptive. The band would play an outdoor show at a park in 1996 and Drew would soon all but disappear. It was at this point that foreign objects had fell in limbo. Darren had come into contact with the legendary record label A&R representative Monty Connor, who had expressed his enjoyment of the EP, but told him that there was no interest in technical death metal at the time. Keep in mind that this was an era where legends like Cynic were getting booed off stage for their brand of death metal. In fact, every landmark technical death metal record of 1993 would result in the nearly immediate dropping of the band from their labels. 
While simultaneously writing new foreign objects material, Darren and Jess had resolved to create a more radio-friendly, grunge-flavored alternative rock under the name Oil. Oil would go on to release their gold tape demo in 1997, though Darren has repeatedly vocalized his discontent with the final product. Several other demo tapes would follow, though they would only further press the malaise the band felt toward their current direction. Oil would eventually recruit the likes of Andy Smith and later Ryan Bruni for bass duties. Oil would play a small tour of several venues on the East Coast, but a new direction was in order after Darren had a frustration-induced episode on the tour. After the two demos and an unsuccessful tour, the band would eventually settle somewhere in the middle of metal and alternative, setting the musical foundation for what would eventually become CKY. Darren would take riffs best suited to death metal and slow them down to a rock groove and apply an unorthodox melodic sense to them that was unlike anything on the radio at the time. Miller and Margera would partially fund this recording with their paychecks from their work at UPS, but mostly via Miller's father's bank account. The two would often take simultaneous sick days when they needed to rehearse or record new song ideas. After hearing an impressive demo by now defunct Pennsylvania band Surge, Miller and Margera would head into Holland, Pennsylvania's Groundhog Studios in November 1997, partially in search of the engineer behind Surge's professional sound. Oh, and by the way, the band went into the recording studio unbeknownst to Ryan Bruni, who would be the subject of unfair treatment during his fairly short time with the band. Then we got Ryan Bruni, who it wasn't good, it wasn't bad, it was just Ryan Bruni. So their search for Serge's producer would lead to none other than Chad Ginsberg. Ginsberg had several years of audio engineering experience under his belt, and even briefly had his own band called Rudy and Blitz. Rudy and Blitz was a punk rock trio that seemingly took the Pixies at their catchiest, Mr. Bungle at their most sonically experimental, and Ween at their lyrically goofiest, or at least that's just how I see it. Rudy and Blitz had nearly inked a deal with Columbia's Rough House Records when it all fell through. This left a sour taste in the mouth of Ginsberg, who held seething resentment for an industry keen on chewing up and spitting out truly passionate artists. This kind of cynical hatred for all things industry endorsed would be shared by Miller and would go on to form the ideological structure upon which CKY would later stand. Miller, Margera, and Ginsberg felt a rapport with each other, and even swapped music. Darren hadn't minded Rudy and Blitz's indie release, Reverb on the Click, and Chad was blown away by an early mix of an unfinished foreign objects track titled Disengage the Simulator. Ginsberg was so impressed with their output, he even offered to join the band. Miller and Margera were happy to let him in, and Oil had finally become a four-piece band. What one should also keep note of here is that in 1998, while simultaneously working on this demo at Groundhog Studios, Darren had become friends again with former This End Up bassist John Teague. John Teague would go on to engineer and co-produce Foreign Objects' first full-length album, one that would not see a release until 2004. So things had begun to truly take shape for Oil, but some loose ends needed tying up. Firstly, what was initially started as a demo began to take shape as a full-length album. The band was so happy with the progress and fullness of the mixes, they were ready to take their work to the next level. Around this time, Ryan Bruni was finally made privy to the recording of this new album and contributed to about 5% of the bass actually heard on the album, with a large majority performed by Miller. Next was the name. Chad had played with the band a few times as Oil, but he hated the name and implored that they change it. They agreed, but they had several different ideas. The prevailing band name during this short period was now I Dismember Mama, a reference to the obscure 1970s thriller of the same name. This name choice would be short-lived, however, when Darren coined the name Camp Kill Yourself while dining at local Westchester joint Amore Pizza. Camp Kill Yourself was now the official name, a unique name for a unique sound. Speaking of sound, Camp Kill Yourself was on another planet in comparison to the generic alt-rock and dime-a-dozen punk of the time. Whereas the written material was exceptional and hard to compare to anything else that was going on, entirely due to Darren's off-the-wall taste in music, Chad Ginsberg's adept flair for the binaurally experimental added new depth to their sound. Camp Kill Yourself was not only a band with metal-flavored rock riffs, but one with a bizarre willingness to try everything and anything when it came to in-studio audio manipulation. 
By late 1998, the band was now in the final stages of progress on their new album. Each song had gone through tons of different mixes, and Darren has even alleged that there were several different mixes per band member. Rio Bravo being one that has around eight alternate mixes floating around online. The album art had been finished, and a music video was even completed for the opening track, as well as the closer. A companion album would also be set for concurrent release, filled to the brim with b-sides and prank calls by friend of the band, Brandon DiCamillo. This album would be released under the title, Volume 1. So here it is. An anthem if I've ever heard one. The opening track, 96 Quite Bitter Beings, kicks off with explosive guitar and pounding drums. The primary riff featured in this song is highlighted by its use of single note patterns and alternate picking with an insane thickness, due in large part to the wonders of the Boss OC2 octave pedal. This song would go on in the annals of time as an oft-forgotten classic, though skaters and even non-CKY fans will recognize this iconic riff. The song itself is short and sweet with a very staccato delivery in the verses. The second verse leads into a thrashy punk-esque two-chord phrasing that leads into another riff that is a slightly different take on the verse riff. The track circles back to the original riff just in time to keep the listener engaged. The lyrics on here are actually a continuation of a story first told on Oil's The Gold Tape. Whereas the Oil song, Thanks for the Ride, seems to only briefly touch on the town of Hellview as a location, 96 Quite Bitter Beings would dive deep into the lore of a remote town gone mad. Think Silent Hill without all the demonic creatures. This story would later be expanded on Infiltrate, Destroy, Rebuild's Escape from Hellview and Carver City's Hellions on Parade, though that entire record is actually set in, I guess, the same fictional universe, if that's what you want to call it. Darren's vocals on this one are just on the borderline between melodic and guttural. With every strained delivery, you get the feeling of unbridled intensity. Jess's drumming locks in with laser positioning, playing so tightly with the guitar riff in a way that I had never experienced before. It's as if he perfectly transcribed the guitar's notes to snare, hi-hat, kick, and ride cymbal hits. Rio Bravo opens on a drudging, dark, ominous guitar riff. The shift in tone from the opener to this track is immediately apparent for anyone who actively listens to rock or metal. This song almost has a ministry meets Manson kind of industrial grime to it. The vocals are heavily layered and drenched in effects. When the second verse kicks in, Darren produces a brooding, hushed whisper delivery that gives me the chills to this day. Lyrically, Darren has stated that the song is about a man who kills his wife in the desert and it was originally titled Rio Bravo Truck Stop, but that changed due to a misprint on the CD's first pressing. They liked the new title, and they stuck with it. This is the first track in which the producer genius of Chad Ginsberg becomes apparent. Whereas 96 was rather straightforward, the very first thing that you hear in this song is what sounds like two strokes on the snare drum in reverse. After a few repetitions of the main riff, parts of it get looped and, well... I don't know, just listen to this shit. Similar to 96, there isn't really a sung chorus in this song. It lies upon a solid foundation set by its superb and devilish guitar playing. Disengage is probably the most radio-friendly song on the record, and for good reason. It's upbeat, happy, it has this whole stoner bro party feel to it. Ironically, the lyrics are somewhat the opposite. On Disengage the Simulator, Darren tells the story of a suicidal guy who drives his car off a cliff only to regret his decision mid-air. Jess's drumming once again locks in tight to the killer riffs played by Miller. I've never been one to pay attention to bass lines, especially if they're not particularly loud, but the bass line in this song is fantastic and a ton of fun to play. This track probably has my favorite vocal performance on the record, with Darren singing in a low register with some sweet background harmonizing. In my opinion, this one song birthed the quintessential formula 
that the CKY sound would become in the future, despite the fact that there aren't any noticeable synths or odd editing techniques in it. Again, there's not really a chorus in this song per se, but the riffs are catchy enough to carry the song. Chad would go on to allege that CKY is a band that does not write choruses, but that is a crock of shit. The ending of this song was a subject of debate amongst the band. How to end a song like this? They initially attempted a dark, almost death metal-like ending, which didn't quite fit, but it is interesting to hear nonetheless. Check it out. In the end, they decided to loop the main riff into a fade out, a much more appropriate closer. Disengage also got a music video, though it wasn't filmed until 2003 for their video album. Sadly, the video just isn't what I had hoped to see from a video based on this kind of song. Okay, so maybe you're sitting there saying, um... What are you talking about? There's no variety on this album. Well, you can stop now. The Human Drive in Hi-Fi is alternative disco. I really don't know what you'd call this, but it's definitely all over the place, and I fucking love it. There's synths, distorted guitars, shakers, wah effects, you name it. There's even guest vocals by Chad, though they are buried deep in the mix. One mix even features Chad singing the entirety of the verses, with Darren taking the chorus vocals. That Chad heavy mix was titled Chad's in Hi-Fi, and I don't prefer it to the album version, but it is worth a listen. I love the disco beats played by Jess on this track, and it really helps to ramp up the intensity on this already strong song. This song has to be one of the more off-the-wall ones on the record, but I guess that's kind of hard to say after hearing the last one. Lost in a Contraption's main riff is played on an acoustic guitar with almost a Middle Eastern feel to it. Interestingly, I never really got the whole Middle Eastern thing until I heard other people bring it up. Some people have even speculated that the acoustic guitar was actually a sitar. The vocals on this track are fantastic in my opinion, though I could see how some might take issue with them. They're pretty quiet and buried in the mix, even. Me and my friend William used to joke around about how Darren's voice sounds like they recorded him underwater in another room separated by five feet of concrete. The lyrics to this song are, to put it mildly, kind of nonsense. Now, Darren has stated that the song is about children conspiring to kill their abusive father, but Darren has also been quoted as saying that every line is about a different subject. I mean... Either way, I think the lyrics are just relatable enough that you could easily come up with a story in your head that could apply to the lyrics. The refrain on this song is punctuated by the use of a keyboard owned by Brandon DiCamillo. Darren had used it on the original Tascam tape demo of the song, and he liked it so much he decided to bring it into the studio. Knee Deep is probably the weakest track on the entire album, but in some ways it stands on its own. The lyrics, in full, are as follows. Some people don't know what is wrong, so they're knee deep, knee deep in sorrow. And that is all. It's repeated over and over throughout the song, and you'd think that that would get super boring about halfway through, but I don't know, for me, it just doesn't. Right as Knee Deep begins to meander, it changes up. 
the riff changes, it gets quieter, it ramps back up, and then closes. It definitely has a sophomoric feel, writing-wise, but somehow even I, and all my elitism, find a lot of enjoyment in this song. There's not really much to say, but I think the main guitar riff here is something to behold, and I love to play this track on the drums. Jess's fills aren't insane or complex, but they fit and they're a lot of fun to play. My Promiscuous Daughter follows in a similar vein as what was heard in Knee Deep, mostly that the lyrics are extremely repetitive. That being said, it's still full of great riffs. I'd say it's probably the closest CKY has ever gotten to writing a full-on punk song. This is one of the only tracks on the album, and actually one of the only tracks in CKY's four albums that prominently features a bass line. Darren has said in the past that bass players hate CKY, and honestly, I'd understand that entirely. Bass is such a non-factor when the music is so guitar-focused. This is also the one and only time Jess's vocals are heard in an officially released CKY track. While not a favorite, I definitely come back to this song often. It's super easy to play on the drums, guitar, and to sing. Nevertheless, it is a song that leaves one to ponder upon a perennial question for the ages. What can be done with my promiscuous daughter? Sarah's mask comes as a bit of a surprise. It's sad, dejected, and slower than anything else on the album. I would almost say that this song doesn't necessarily fit on the record, but it's just dark and off-putting enough to fit. Darren has often remarked about his dissatisfaction with his vocal performance on this one, but I actually think it works. After listening closely, I noticed a couple phrases sung slightly out of key, but it's barely noticeable. There's also a low-pitched vocal track in the chorus that's buried deep in the mix, but it's really fucking cool once you notice it. The drums are pretty straightforward, but I appreciate Jess's use of rim shots in the first bridge of the song. Chad implements the use of this really weird computer beep synth sound as the first bridge ends, and it's that kind of unneeded adding of extra sounds and textures that really makes me believe that Chad is a production genius. Funny story about this one, my old high school buddy's favorite song on the entire album is Sarah's Mask and he even tried to fuck his girlfriend to it. Needless to say, she wasn't into it. To All of You is one of my favorites for sure. This album is so special to me that I honestly can't name a true favorite, but To All Of You is the closest it gets for me. To All Of You was actually the first CKY song that made me really pay attention to CKY. It was 2013, and I had been familiar with the name CKY since I was five, mostly due to Viva La Bam and skateboard culture, but I had looked up Bam Margera after being curious about his pre-Jackass work. I was led to the Land Speed CKY video and didn't particularly pay attention to any of the soundtrack until To All Of You. I was blown away by the unmitigated melancholy of this song. And that was it. I was officially a CKY fan from that day forward. Now this song, as said by Darren, was actually inspired by My Bloody Valentine's landmark 1991 record Loveless. And to end a rock record in the late 90s with a shoegaze track is just a fantastic move. From this point onward, CKY would leave their most mellow and morose songs as the closers on their albums. Everything from the extremely basic drum playing to the weird guitar layering to the barely audible vocals screams shoegaze, and it's a damn shame 
that the internet shoegaze community have not really taken notice of this song. And well, that's about all. I hope you guys enjoyed this long-winded review and maybe even learned something that you didn't know in the process. So if you enjoy this video, I encourage you to like, subscribe. 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 Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait up. You didn't think I'd forget Halfway House, did you? What kind of plebeian scum do you take me for? So, there's no real reason to review the Rio Bravo reprise, as it's just a tweaked version of the Rio Bravo remix meant to fool the listener into thinking that they've reached the end of the album, followed by a nearly 13-minute low hum. Halfway House, though, is probably the most off-the-wall song here. Sure, it's mellow, but the feeling of, I don't know, ominous, looming danger is all-encompassing. The guitars sound almost out of tune, which helps add to this whole not-so-safe atmosphere. Darren whispers some of the best lyrics on this album, and just when you begin to feel as if the whole song is going to be subdued and low energy, all hell breaks loose. This hard pivot was extremely impressive to me when I first heard it. It's just so schizophrenic in a way that feels sincere and Chad adds some accents on lead guitar here, and they really add some color to the mix. And Jess's more laid-back drumming fits perfectly. This song was initially conceived sometime in early 1996 as a high-intensity rock song. Most fans actually prefer this version to that which was featured on the album. and CKY would go on to re-record this version in 2011, but fans still favored the oil recording above all. Volume 1 would release concurrently with Bam Margera's debut skate video, CKY, and the previously mentioned Volume 2, which would be sold in local skate shops. CKY, the skate video, well, okay, for those in the know, let's just call it land speed, would feature nearly every song on the album, as well as a host of B-sides and foreign object songs, which would also end up on Volume 2. Volume 1 has seen a ton of repressings, remasters, and re-releases over the years, the first few mostly as a result of their name and artwork. Camp Kill Yourself was an intriguing name, but after getting picked up by Volcom Entertainment, it would draw the ire of some of the higher-ups there, and the band was forced to change their name. At which point, Volcom had ordered all copies with the original name and artwork destroyed. According to legend, the band snuck out of the pressing plant with just under a thousand copies to sell on the 2000 Warp Tour. Very few of these particular Volcom Volume 1s are still floating around, and if you do happen to come across one online or elsewhere, don't expect it to come cheap. And the fourth overall pressing of the album would be one hated by the band. The album's title was now CKY, with the band name being Camp. The next pressing would reverse the two, and the final Vulcum Entertainment pressing would be under the title Camp Volume 1. The band would finally solidify the album's title after Island Records released the remastered edition in 2001. Volume 1 would put CKY on the map, and its songs would be featured on MTV's Jackass and in several video games, most notably Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. The 96 Quite Bitter Beings video would receive moderate airplay on MTV which would further boost album sales and popularity. To this day, Volume 1 has sold somewhere over 220,000 copies, a great success for such a non-conforming band. In 2000, 
CKY would fire Ryan Bruni just before the Warp Tour and would gain new live bassist Vernon Zaborowski, or just Vern, who was known for his ridiculous and off-the-wall stage presence. The stage was now set for CKY to dial in their sound and capture new listeners. They would head into the studio with a strong and dedicated fan base backing them, a label that they truly felt believed in them, and a sense of direction for the future. The following album would be, in the eyes of most, CKY's magnum opus, and become their most popular record to date. So there you have it. The video's actually over now. So uh, if you did actually enjoy this, I'd wager to guess that there's more where this came from. So hit the like, hit the subscribe, but uh, make sure to tell your friends that there's this guy doing super long music retrospectives that aren't about the same fucking shitty overplayed rap and pop albums. I'm a darker standard. Peace. Oh.